Hello everyone, and welcome back once again to my journey through One Piece. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the shorter Logtown arc, and I'm also going to be summing up my thoughts on the East Blue Saga as a whole. So uh, I'll just be doing a very quick general summation of my thoughts on it so far before we get into the next saga, whatever it's called, and the next arc. But before we get started, I just want to again remind you, if you're interested in my next review of the next arc, uh, early access for it, you can do that by heading over to my Patreon right Right now. Uh, it's currently available right on there for $5 patrons. Uh, so if you watch this on YouTube and want to, uh, want to watch the next one right away, then there's access to that for patrons if you don't want to wait for it to be released publicly on YouTube. But enough of that, uh, let's get into the AJP's comments for this video. Um, just a reminder that these were the comments for the Baratie arc that I'll be reading and responding to right now. Once again, if you'd like your comments to be potentially read by me at the beginning of a video like this, just make sure to include the hashtag AJP's in them uh, somewhere in the comments so they'll be entered into that pool. The first one's from Flint who says that I know you read the Viz translation, so you should know that there was a translation error during the Zoro vs. Mihawk portion. During their fight, Mihawk ask Zoro something along the lines of, what would you do after you accomplish your dream? To which Zoro doesn't have any answer. It's a very important line for Zoro's character in the future, so I thought you should know. Uh, yeah, so, uh, thank you for bringing that to my attention. I did know that already, uh, it was pointed out to me already, and for anyone else who isn't aware or doesn't know, uh, I am reading the Viz translations for these. In situations where it's badly translated, chat will remind me, or tell me about the differences, or in rare circumstances I'll read the fan translation to just see a more accurate translation translation of both certain story points. That was one of them. Uh, that seems like a very important moment, and line, as Zoro just doesn't really have any answer when Mihawk asks him, what are you going to do after this? He just seems to be very tunnel visioned and fixated on this goal of becoming the ultimate swordsman, the greatest swordsman in the world, which kind of hints at the idea of there being maybe an aimlessness once he does achieve that, or just a lack of longer term thinking. Now don't get me wrong, um, there are levels to long term. I don't expect Zoro to become the greatest swordsman within 50 to 100 chapters or something like that. I think it's as long term as the rest of the goals of the rest of the Straw Hats. So I don't mean to say that Zoro's goal right now doesn't go far off into the future, but not being able to know what you're going to do after that is an interesting point, and I definitely uh, made note of that when I first went through it. But yeah, just a couple of notes about which translation I'm reading, and I am aware of this. The next one's from Pit Dark Angel, who says, What's interesting about the Baratie arc is that when Nami leaves and Usopp and Zoro go after her, Luffy's actually left alone without his crew. And because of that, Sanji is in a sense the second first crew member that Luffy recruits. And the dreams of the first two members, Zoro and Sanji, reflect the two sides of Luffy's dreams. Zoro shares the conviction part of having a dream that directly puts him in conflict with the strongest guys in the world that they need to overcome to either become the Pirate King or the strongest swordsman. On the other hand, Sanji shares the dreamer aspect of wanting to find this place or thing of legend that may not even be true, that you need to believe in harder than anyone else to even consider that the journey to find it may be worthwhile. That's a really interesting take. I think on the whole of it, I pretty much agree, though I do think there's obviously overlap. Not saying that this comment or this concept or theory whatever you would call it, discounts the idea of overlap, but just a note, I think it's interesting that Sanji's dream has this this implication or this primary focus on it of being the dreamer, that far off great Gatsby-esque thing. But at the same time, there is definitely that aspect of having to fight your way through a little bit to get towards it, fighting in one way or another. Whereas Zoro's is very directly, you need to fight your way through everything to become the greatest. But I also see that dreamer aspect in Zoro as well. I, I find something about his dream to become the greatest to be uh, a little bit poetic, maybe because of the way it resonates because of what it's rooted in, his promise, right? But yeah, and I love how there are two sides of Luffy that kind of coalesce in him. So I like that there are commonalities between these dreamers or these people with goals, and yet there are definite complexions and priorities with regards to each one. The next one is from Just My Opinion, who asks, You noticed a lot of the themes early on in One Piece, but which strikes you as the most powerful, emotional, and central to the story? Uh, that's a hard one. I don't know if I can actually really answer. There's the obvious caveat that I've only read a hundred chapters, but if I had to say one, you know, there are lots of primary ones, uh, the idea of freedom, the nuances of freedom, the different ideas of piracy, the ways that others conceptualize life, inherited will, and legacy. 
and all of those are very powerful and very emotional, but if I had to say one, I would say the theme that strikes me the most is just the concept of dreams, the concept of living for these far off dreams that all, all the members of the crew have, and trying their best to achieve them, and the things that they will do in service of that, and what it means for them, and how they all have this kinship in searching for these dreams, despite having different ones, and how they bond through knowing that they all have this commonality between them, and that spirit and soul is what links them on this journey. Just the way in which all these different dreams of all the different characters so far has been executed is very emotional and resonant to me, so it's a pretty broad theme but nonetheless I think it's the most powerful for me so far. Next question is from Jimmy Ichigo who asks, if you had to predict, outside of Luffy, which of the characters that you've met so far do you think that you'll love the most by the end? That's really tough as well. <laughs> I mean you guys have seen my character ranking and you'll see it again this video, but outside of Luffy, who is by no means secured as the number one by the end, who knows. It depends on how the story approaches things, because if Shanks suddenly becomes a prominent fixture in the story, I don't expect him to become part of the crew or anything like that, but if they dwell on him more than they have done so far, and by they I guess I just mean Oda, then I can easily see Shanks going really close up to that number one spot or challenging for it, but that's only if Oda decides that he wants to do that with Shanks, and only if he's used properly in moderation, because I think a character like Shanks can't really be used super consistently. I think he works best when used in moderation as this ideal and this man that we see in just small glimpses here and there. But yeah, so he's a possibility if, even with that in mind, Oda decides to bring him into the fore a bit more. Same sort of deal with Mihawk, honestly. Mihawk strikes me as a character that if Oda decides he should become a permanent fixture or a bigger focus in the story, which I know he's going to come back, it's very obvious, but if he becomes very prominent, I could easily see Mihawk shooting right up. But those are highly dependent on what Oda decides to do with those characters, so those are just kind of side notes. But if I had to predict, it would be between either Zoro or Usopp. Zoro is just... continues to shock me in the way that he can be presented in such a way that I feel so connected to his dream and want him so much to achieve what he wants to achieve because of the sheer conviction and fervor he has for it, and the sheer respect he has for Luffy and how he doesn't want to disappoint him, and how brave and courageous he is, and how he embodies this reckless, without a doubt, but bold and inspirational pirate spirit. So if that continues, Zoro could very easily become my favorite. But Usopp as well, you probably got this just through following my videos so far, but Usopp, I think there is so much promise. His goal is essentially to become brave. He is the closest thing to an everyman in the story, the closest thing to it. If you had to pick one from the Straw Hats so far, he would definitely be the closest one to it. He gets scared, he becomes a coward at times, he sometimes just doesn't want to fight, he runs away, he lies, he tells tall tales, and he's flawed. Not to say that the others aren't flawed as well, obviously, but he's very flawed in very human and relatable ways. And yet, he strives past that to fight for what he wants to protect, for his friends, for his dream, to become more of the person that he wants to be. This very much seems like, for Usopp, this story seems like a coming of age for him in a more unique way than it is for any of the other characters. I would love to see him become that person he wants to be, to become more brave, and yet not lose that sight of who he is in the first place. Sure, maybe by the end of the series, he's completely brave and he never runs away, and stuff like that. But I want to see the gradual evolution, I want to see him slowly overcoming that, and regressing, and progressing, and having to grapple with and deal with his insecurities, and going through many, many arcs within his grander arc of personal growth. That entices me so much. And so if things are approached with quality, in that way, I could easily see Usopp becoming my favorite as well. So I guess I cheated, but either Zoro or Usopp, I think, at the moment, but this is obviously very uh, fluid. The second last question comes from Michael Yu. Since this comment will be read in the Logtown video, do you have a preference so far between the more tight and focused Oda arcs, like Romance Dawn or Logtown, or the larger and more sprawling ones, like Baratie or Arlong Park? Some tend to agree that the shorter ones are more focused and efficient, but that the longer have higher peaks. It's a good question. Maybe it would be best to ask me this 
a few months down the line when I've read a couple more hundred chapters when I had more to compare. But at the moment, I don't really have a preference. I think that Oda has great strengths when it comes to both the shorter arcs and the longer ones. We'll talk more later in the video about why I like Logtown in particular and uh, what Oda puts into this and how focused and tight and integrative it is. But in general, I think that Oda, through the small sample size so far, uh, is really good at transitioning things really organically, giving us just glimpses and snapshots of things going on throughout the world, integrating them in certain ways, uh, setting the stage and laying foundations, really mechanically effective, and then setting us off for the next adventure, whether it be a long arc or a shorter one, whatever it may be. There's just such a distinct sense of piecing and focus when it comes to the shorter arcs that I've read so far that I think is really, really enticing and engaging. But on the other hand, I really like what Oda does with the longer ones because it's a sort of gradual building up of a theme. We get bits and pieces from lines from characters, bits of dialogue, uh, internalization, uh, maybe indirect characterization or indirect theming that build up over the course of the arc as we go on through 20, 25 chapters or however long it is. And then it just culminates by the end or at specific points in really, really effective ways. Like the way it all came together for Syrup Village was so cohesive and poetic. I just loved it. Uh, same with Arlong Park, same with many climaxes throughout Baratie. So that's something that he can really only do in the longer arcs, that gradual buildup. And yes, the pacing isn't as tight or focused, and it can get a bit thin in certain places, maybe as there's a bit of uh, a focus on the fights, for example, which is fine. I'm not complaining, I'm not criticizing, but for me personally, the fights are one of the least important aspects uh, to the series, or to any series. And then so in the longer arcs, you can slowly, gradually build these ideas of what the arc is encapsulating what it's trying to communicate and then seeing it all come together so far has been extremely gratifying so you can't really have that in the shorter arcs but just as well you can't really have that sense of really engaging taut pacing and that specific sort of integration in the longer ones so i really like them equally i can't really say at the moment that i have a preference i'm just glad that Oda can go from one arc to another and have different strengths from one to another. It keeps things fresh and variable. And then the last one is from Kalselmo Anairu who says, My favorite thing about these reviews is how you don't try to be a quote unquote critic. You don't look for things to dislike like other people on YouTube do. You just go in and enjoy and talk about what you find interesting. I love that. That's very sweet of you. That's very sweet of you to say thank you for saying so. I'm glad you enjoy that and I hope others enjoy that as well. Yeah, if it hasn't been made clear already, I'm not a critic. I've done two critical videos in my life. They're very long and extensive and I actually think they're a couple of my best, but I've basically only done two critical videos in my entire life. I'm not a critic. I just talk about what I love in stories or like in stories or find interesting, whether it be characters, themes, whatever. And so these are much more like reviews about what I found most interesting and emotional and good and enjoyable than they are critiques. I'm not interested in being a critic, I'm just interested in talking about what I like. I'm definitely not someone who goes into something thinking I need to find flaws to validate myself as someone who's balanced or critical or unbiased or something like that. I don't care about that, I'm just reading One Piece, I'm enjoying it, and I'm just sharing with you guys what I enjoy most about it. So uh, if that approach works for you, perfect. Um, if it doesn't, very understandable. There's definitely a niche for critics, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just the way I like to approach these sorts of reviews. But yeah, those are all the questions for this week. Thank you everyone who sent them in. Lots of great ones. And once again, if you'd like to be a part of this, like your question to be potentially read in the next video, or two videos from now, I guess, uh, remember to use the hashtag AJPeace. Thank you once again for the continued support in the comments in the video. If you do like these videos, please feel free to leave comments and uh, likes and share them around. The more people who have eyes on this, the more engaging it'll be for everyone and myself, and it'll make the experience even more fun. Thank you everyone for supporting on Patreon. I hope you're enjoying the early access. Thank you everyone who comes out to the streams. And if you would like to participate in the streams and participate in my live experience of these chapters and One Piece as a whole, uh, you can follow me on Twitter where I stream every Sunday I do One Piece reads, some Fridays here and there as well. And just one thing that I kind of need to talk about with regards to these reviews, I've been seeing it 
crop up here and there in the comments, uh, just be aware that because I'm not scripted, I literally just have a a list of bullet points that I look and I go, oh, okay, that plot point, I want to talk about that, and then I just go off. Um, because of this being totally unfiltered and unscripted and off the cuff and casual, a lot of times the wording I use won't be the best or optimal way to articulate what I want to articulate. I try my best to do that, so just be aware of that. Uh, there's no real need to focus super intensely on my word choice because it's off the cuff, it's casual, it's not super deliberate and I might not say exactly what I mean in the moment just due to the nature of these reviews. And I could get things wrong, I could be inaccurate at times, I'm by no means an expert, I'm an amateur when it comes to One Piece and I'm just sharing my thoughts and experience. Uh, but so yeah, just thought that was worth mentioning. So Log Town, really interesting arc. It's one of my favorites so far. I enjoyed it a hell of a lot, and one of the first things I realized or noticed was the name of it. So far there have been arcs that are just the, essentially the names of the locations that they take place in. Sierra Village, Bratie, Arlong Park, those are all just locations in one way or another. I guess Orange Town is, is every single one? No, Romance Dawn doesn't count I guess. Either way, One Piece tends to focus on the arcs being, the name of the arcs being locations, so far. And Log Town continues that trend I guess, but yeah what's interesting about Log Town is that the name alludes to both epilogues and prologues, a jumping off point, a transition point. The town itself is referred to as the town of the beginning and the end, and that is very much clear through the name. Log Town, epilogues, prologues, uh, legacy is being passed down, passing the torch, and uh, we're gonna get into that in just a second, but that very clearly seems to be the intent of the name. And what's interesting is that it can also very clearly refer to rogues. Like the Viz translation, which I know is incorrect, but it says rogue town, and the town is full of rogues. So it can work dualistically in that way, which I just found uh, funny and kind of interesting. But yeah, Log Town does so much. It's so integrative. There are so many elements packed into these five chapters, and I enjoyed it a lot. There was so much, there was so rich and engaging, there was so much content here. Uh, it was by far the densest arc we've had so far. Primarily, if I had to put it down to one thing, it feels, like I alluded to, like the passing of the torch. Uh, inherited will, I guess, an extension of that. But just, it talks about legacies, this little arc. It talks about, because this was where Gold Roger was executed, and this is where Luffy almost gets executed, I guess you could say. So it almost feels like the epilogue of Gold Roger's story, the last vestiges of his embers of piracy, of his reign, and it feels like that torch gets passed on to Luffy, standing where he stood, being put in the guillotine just as he was. And it doesn't only feel that way because of those base similarities, but I think we're jumping ahead a little bit, but I think that the way that Smoker conceptualizes Luffy and his smile, and how that directly reflects Gold Roger and what he stood for and how he lived his life, boisterous and smiling from what I can tell, the parallels there are very clear. And so Luffy seems like he's receiving Gold Roger's torch, not just because he's the protagonist of our story, but because he so directly embodies that spirit of piracy, that expression, that sheer longing for adventure and becoming the king of the pirates, and just taking on these challenges of life with a smile, with relish and fervor, being that dreamer thinking idealistically, looking at challenges and not backing down and having conviction and fighting for those you want to protect and for what you believe in. I think all of that is encapsulated in Luffy, that's been clear so far, and that seems to be an extension of what Gold Roger stood for. I could be reading into it a bit much, we don't get a ton of characterization for Gold Roger, but the way in which Smoker noted that Luffy embodied what he seemed to embody was very striking and powerful to me. And so it makes sense that this is the end of Luffy's prologue, essentially. The end of the prologue of One Piece, and as well the end of the epilogue of Gold Roger's era, and the beginning of this new Pirate King. It's the jumping off point, and it's so thrilling to see that to see that articulated through the text. This is just the beginning. You know, I've been reading this for months. I've read a hundred chapters. I, I am admittedly going at a slower pace, but 
I've dedicated quite a bit of time to reading this much and discussing this much, and I have not even touched 10% of what the story is, so you see that this is essentially the start of the adventure, despite the adventure we've had already so far, and it's just really thrilling. But in addition to that, this arc also represents cohesion and integration of all these disparate ideas that Oda had been building up until this point, and how they come together. It's a culmination and payoff of so many background elements, whether they be plot elements that were going on in the background that we didn't see, but we had sprinkles of throughout, whether it be the cover stories and how they come to fruition here through Alvida and Buggy, whether it be looking at how our crew affects the world and how their notoriety, specifically Luffy's, is increasing as a result of these adventures that we've taken part in, seeing Shanks, seeing Mihawk again, seeing Yasop, Usopp's dad as well, it all just feels so grand and interconnected in the scope and the way that everything's so cohesive within the world, despite how grand it seems, the scope here is just illustrated so well. This is the first arc where I really read it and felt the sheer scale of the world for the first time and how Every little interaction affects other interactions and come back organically for immense payoff, for interesting interactions. There are so many different threads going on in parallel, and so far it doesn't seem like Oda intends to stop building those connections, and I hope that it doesn't become too much and that the story doesn't buckle under the weight of all this, but if it doesn't, and if it all coalesces seamlessly as it did here, in the future with more and more plot points and characters and world building details, that is right up my alley, so I'm filled with excitement of that. And Logtown is an encapsulation of basically that concept. It's all very rewarding, it feels very gratifying. The cover stories, they come to fruition here, and it's like you don't necessarily have to have been paying attention to the cover stories like I have been, thanks to you guys, to really get appreciation out of this arc, but if you would have been paying attention to the cover stories, you get optimal appreciation, like the ceiling is higher for your enjoyment, and it does feel very rewarding in that way, and very gratifying. As we see the grand expanse of the world, and just the sheer scale, I keep I keep harping on about the scale, and I'll probably continue harping on about the scale, but it really is palpable here. And it transitions from the end of Arlong into the beginning of the next saga, or the next arc, or whatever that's gonna be. And it does that very well, but also just shows a snapshot of so many different elements throughout the world, and where our characters are at, where they'll potentially go, what their dreams are, what the dreams of the potential antagonists are, it just does so much. I like to compare it to uh, the Heaven's Arena arc in Hunter x Hunter, which mechanically sets up so many things and lays so many foundations, while also flowing really well and being really taut and tight and focused, but I really have a thing for arcs that can do a lot of things mechanically and pull off a lot of functions, while also just being fun in and of themselves and so engaging. So I'd make that comparison, I guess, a bit of an abstract one, a bit of a vague one, but nonetheless. But yeah, this shows the grand expanse of the world, how big it is, it's very tight and focused and doesn't waste its time, but at the same time it's very fun, it's very rich, it does so much. It felt like just a summation of Luffy, of his quest, of his crew, of legacy, of piracy in general, of how the world is affected by those who go on these quests. And like I said, it's a passing of the torch thematically and in terms of spirit, in a way slightly different from the ways that other arcs have done it, but nonetheless it all falls under the same umbrella, I think. But to get into the actual arc itself, chapter 100 was really great. Chat had me playing the Onto the Grand Line, or whatever the song is called, uh, soundtrack as I was reading through it, and that made for an amazing ending to the small little arc here, and an amazing transition into what is going to come, just a great sense of adventure. Chapter 100 was great. Honestly though, my favorite was chapter 96, the first, the beginning of the arc, the first chapter. Immediately it draws you in and shows you all the moving pieces associated with this world, and it all kind of dawns on you at the same time, uh, just all at once in chapter 96 for me. I just found it an extremely thrilling chapter. I, I loved it. It's among my favorite in the entire series so far. And 100 is as well. But it doesn't really matter. Uh, it doesn't really mean anything to compare them. I just say this to try and illustrate how strong the beginning of this arc was for me. And so, to properly start off the arc, we just have some hijinks with the crew. Not too much happening there. But then we cut to the Navy, which is shown in a very militaristic, very straight-laced, authoritative, focused light as they go over the bounties that have accumulated over the last little while. And 
we have what is what I've been told is an indirect form of power scaling through showing the bounties for the different characters we've seen so far. We have Buggy for 10 million, we have Don Krieg for 17 million, we have Arlong for 20 million, and we have Luffy for 30 million, which is just interesting. It's interesting to see the bounties and the respective characters we've seen so far. Interestingly enough, for the antagonists, it goes up the farther in the story we go. So Buggy was early on, he was actually 15 million, not 10 million, so excuse me. Don Krieg was in Baratie, and he's 17 million, and then Arlong was in Arlong Park, obviously, the last arc we did, and he has the highest bounty of the antagonists, which makes sense. The scales consistently go up as we go on in the story. And what's interesting that was pointed out to me is that Captain Kudo from Syrup Village is not here because the Navy just aren't aware of him. They are not aware of his exploits. And uh, he had successfully hidden himself, right? So that's a nice little detail. But I find it funny that Luffy's described once again as this evil, vicious pirate with this huge bounty, and we need to stop this guy. And like I said in the last video, his picture is just so happy-go-lucky and seemingly harmless. And what's funny that I didn't mention, I think, last video is that we have, like, the back of Usopp's head is in the corner of Luffy's bounty photo. And uh, later on, we have Usopp looking at it and going, look how cool, they have a bounty for me, I'm in here, which is just cute, uh, very Usopp. And Usopp had, of course, seen that in a newspaper. Luffy reads the same thing, he sees his bounty, and he just smiles. You know, it's kind of part of the process. If you're trying to become the Pirate King and get the One Piece, this sort of infamy is probably a signifier that you're doing something right. So naturally, Luffy looks at it and just gives this broad, ear-to-ear -ear grin. But most interesting about this scene to me was the attitude and how the military is introduced here. Like I said, very weighty military scene. Very serious. A bit of a different complexion to them than we've seen so far. As we see this operation and how dedicated they are to this, they say quite literally, it's up to us, not the citizens, to carry this out. We are justice. If evil forces sail the seas, then it's up to us to crush it. So they very much feel this duty, and they very much are dedicated and committed to carrying this duty out. And uh, lots of nice little panels as we see side profiles of a lot of the Navy officers. Not sure if this was a hint to important ones down the line, but nonetheless, it looks really cool. I love how it's presented. It's very militaristic, obviously, and it's just a nice expansion of my impression of what the military were, or the, the Navy were. Nice establishment for what I assume would be a bit of a different take on the Navy after what we've seen. But with our crew, with our protagonists, they're just kind of shooting the shit, talking about whatever, and uh, their, their bounties, I think. And then they see an island approaching. I think Zoro mentions, oh, there's an island right there. And then Nami, being the navigator that she is, goes, there it is. This is the signifier that we're close to the Grand Line. This is Logtown. They call it the town of the beginning and the end, and Luffy immediately sees, oh, that's the town where the Pirate King, the, the old Pirate King, was executed. And so of course he wants to go there, he wants to stand where he stood. Uh, figuratively. And then so I really love the presentation of Logtown. It's very large and bustling and you see all sorts of little details throughout the streets. There are, it seems to be a bit of a trading hub, a bit of a tourist attraction in one way or another. There's the huge uh, navy influence here. Uh, there's just all sorts of things going on. There's lots of little niche shops, for instance, what we see with Zoro with the swords. There's just lots going on here. It seems to be a bit of a hub and it being the jumping off point before the Grand Line is significant thematically, and just in terms of the world, it makes sense. This last stop before you get there, I don't know if it's the literal last stop, but it seems to be what's known as one of the last places to go before you get into the Grand Line. So it makes sense that, in terms of world building, that it would be this huge hub for everyone to gather up on whatever supplies you need to continue on. Or maybe it's just a tourist attraction for some, depending on their motivation and what they're here for. But uh, it makes sense that it would be this large and bustling, and I loved all the illustrations of it and the atmosphere of the town. There's a bit of hijinks that go on. There's this woman who, in the streets, Zoro sees that takes care of a, a couple of ne'er-dwells, and uh, she puts on her glasses and she says thank you for Zoro for giving her her glasses that she had lost. And uh, that's a bit of a precursor to something we'll talk about in a bit. But then after that, we have what was maybe uh, one of my favorite scenes in the whole in the whole arc. As Mihawk brings news of Luffy's bounty, 
and infamy and the name he's making for himself to the rest of his crew or not not literal maybe not literal crew but a bunch of impressive looking figures among them is Usopp's dad Yasop and Shanks which is so exciting to me so many interesting well three really interesting characters together in one faction or something what are they planning what are they doing are they the seven warlords that were talked about before is shanks one of the seven warlords of the sea because we know that mihawk is one of them and since he seems to have a familiarity with them and going oh you might want to see this and uh i don't know there seems to be some element of camaraderie here are they the seven or do they meet up? Are they a crew together? I don't know, lots of unknowns. But the familiarity here was really interesting because it draws these questions in your mind. Are they the warlords? And then we see this great illustration of Shanks, his face shadowed over, but in white, in contrast, we see his eyes just beaming with pride, it seems like, this scar on his face, and this wide-eyed grin at the exploits of his pupil, I guess you could say. And it's just a, an amazing moment. And I love that Oda decided to put this in here because it's a great way to check in with him and offer all these hooks of intrigue for stuff going forward. All these questions that I'm asking, I just can't wait for them to be answered. And how do him and Mihawk know each other? Those two were two of the coolest characters in the story up until this point. And to have them together, it's so cool. It's so awesome. I want to know what's going on there. Uh, and Yasop interesting establishment for him he looks really cool i want to know what's going on with him it was just awesome i was fanboying at this when i read it and then we get a little bit of a flashback to not a flashback but a flash of windmill village reacting to seeing luffy's bounty and they go god damn well he's made a bit of a name for himself someone says to the mayor are you worried it was his dream after all and the mayor just goes his dream or his destiny was he always destined to be this and that is just such a great line. It's almost like, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Was it his destiny? Was it fate? Uh, or did he just blaze this path for himself due to his own will? And was his own will almost fatalistic in how strong it was? Or is he just naturally doing what Luffy does? And his, his conviction and yearning for this, is it just so strong that it feels fatalistic? Either way, it doesn't really matter, honestly. It, the nuance of that doesn't really matter. But that line from the mayor is just really great in conceptualizing him, putting up in front the nature of Luffy and what he stands for and what he dreams about. So yeah, this chapter was an, sort of an encapsulation. The first chapter was an encapsulation of what this arc was as a whole. Uh, you know, obviously keeping up with our protagonist, but seeing the reaction of people around the world to their exploits and how things are interconnected and how things build up and how foundations are laid. Uh, with all these different characters we've come to know in the background, coming together here, interspersing bits of different situations and different characters. I love it. I loved it. We see the Navy, we see Shanks and Mihawk and what's going on with them, we see Windmill Village, we later see the people who have been built up through the cover stories who have been trying to hunt Luffy. It's just all these different elements, they come together. It's so cool. And then it's nice to see just generally the crew doing fun kind of slice of lifey things throughout the town uh, we see Nami trying on a bunch of dresses and and clothes and things like that and then just leaving uh, after trying them on uh, which is hilarious we see a couple other things and then we see Luffy seeing the execution scaffolding where Gold's Roger was was executed and this is a huge moment it feels like there's a bunch of weight in this moment not just for Luffy, but for the story as a whole. It seems to be where two legendary stories overlap in this moment. The way that the panel is drawn. It's one of my favorite panels in the whole series up until this point. It's just negative space. It's a completely white background. And we just have a side profile of Luffy, a wide shot in manga terms. Far in the distance of Luffy, just looking at the execution scaffolding. And there's little bits of dust flowing in the wind but aside from that there's no background it's just him and the place where his spiritual ancestor i would say died where he died and the great age of the pirates began and it's a wonderful moment it just feels like it feels like what i talked about before about the passing of the torch it indicates being close to the grand line it indicates carrying on his spirit it indicates being the torchbearer of this new age it's just a big deal 
and Luffy needs to see where this history was played out. That's why he searches this scaffolding out. Uh, first, first thing, it's the first thing he does when he gets here, and it's the only thing he's really concerned about. It feels to me like his roots, his inspiration. Of course, Shanks is his role model and his inspiration in a more personal way, but Gold Roger and his legacy and what he left behind is all-encompassing and grander than even Shanks could be. It feels like if you take a bird's eye view, Gold Roger is the catalyst, the progenitor of, of everything here, of everything while Shanks is a more personal and intimate inspiration for Luffy. That's just the way I view it, I guess. Hopefully you understand what I mean. But nonetheless, this is deeply important to Luffy. We then get some more stuff with Zoro as he goes to that, that shop where he learns uh, through the woman that he first, that he met, the, the clumsiest woman, that there are 21 great swords, legendary swords. The Great 21 is what it's called in my translation. Uh, and Zoro owns one of them, the Wado Ichimonji. And it's a fun little exchange as we have a back and forth between the shopkeep who's trying to buy Zoro's legendary sword for cheap, and uh, Yashigi, the girl. Her name's introduced later, but I'm just I'm naming her right now. Yashigi, who's a sword nerd, very endearing in that way, kind of cute, you know, and she says, you know, this is a legendary sword. It's just interesting. It's it's some nice world building that there are these 21 great swords. Zoro has somehow stumbled upon one of them, and it's just cool adding culture and richness and depth to the world. It's just another legend to add on there, to add to the litany, the growing litany of things that prop up this world as rich and breathing and full of depth and breadth. And what's very Zoro is that upon learning that he owns one of the legendary swords, he doesn't really have much to say about it. He just goes, oh, okay. Very unassuming. He doesn't really care about the lofty status of it. It's very Zoro, very simple, very loyal to what's been established that the person he is so far. But Tashigi says something really interesting that is a perspective we haven't really seen in the story so far. And she says that uh, talking about Zoro, not knowing that Zoro is Zoro, she classifies him as a bad man, as an evil man, and she says, uh, being the sword nerd that she is, and I say that very endearingly, that there's so much evil in the world, and that swords that are used for such evil, like swords that are used under the employ, so to speak, of people like Roran or Zoro, must be crying, that they have to be used for such evil things. Swords that are used by pirates or bounty hunters, or for these evil deeds, they must be crying as if these swords are alive. Tashigi is very idealistic with regards, and, and romantic, with regards to her ideas of what swords are. She speaks as if they have feelings. She speaks as if they should only ever be used for what she views as good things, good deeds, uh, deeds that are worthy of swordsmanship. And so, I don't know if this is going to be something that Oda explores, but it, the idea that came to my mind immediately would be a potential minor character arc for this character Tashigi would be her coming to learn about the true nature of the world and what swords are being used for and that maybe her way of thinking and conceptualizing what good even means in the realm of swords may be completely misled or maybe narrow narrow-minded or, or tunnel visioned and that she needs to open her perspective and understand where people like Zoro come from and what all these coalescing uh, interrelated dreams may consist of. A bit of a brutal awakening arc is something that I think is a possibility. Not sure if Oda will go that direction with her, but the way that she uh, realizes by the end of the arc that Zoro is Zoro and wants to hunt after him or go after him, the potential is there for something like that. But nonetheless, as it stands, uh, she's pretty interesting for, for reasons we'll get into in a bit. And I like what she brought to the fore with regards to swords having feelings and swords crying and what they should be used for in the first place. Uh, it's just an opinion that's put out there. It's not stated to be right or wrong, correct or incorrect. It's just interesting. And it adds to the ideologies that are... Uh, that are the center and core of One Piece. But Zoro is then told that one of the swords for sale is a cursed sword. These cursed swords essentially consistently lead to swordsmen's deaths, the, the deaths of anyone who used them. And Zoro, being the man that he is, says, I don't care about that. He almost looks at it as a challenge to overcome on his quest to becoming the greatest swordsman. Uh, which I love. It's so, it's so Zoro. And one of the best moments in the entire series up until now happens in this scene 
where he takes the sword, he puts his arm out like this, just tosses it up as it twirls in the air over his arm. And the way that the arc goes, it misses his arm and then just lodges itself into the floor. And then with a grin, seeing that he's unscathed, that was his show of resolve. That was his sign. He could have easily had his arm extremely injured or depending on how sharp it is or how powerful or bewitched it is maybe on the extreme end of things cut off who knows he would have hurt himself and so he was so daring in doing this but he just believes in his quote-unquote luck or he rather he makes his own luck and he does this as a show of daring and boldness as an encapsulation of what his quest is and it doesn't it doesn't hurt him it doesn't touch him and so he goes you know what i'll take it and zoro has three swords again and it makes him feel whole again just an awesome, awesome Zoro moment. Actually, one of my favorites. Just the type of man he is, his conviction, how he's going all in on this dream, and how he doesn't really care about the reputation of swords being cursed or his sword being legendary. A sword is what a sword is to him. And he will blaze a path for himself regardless of all of this. And a nice little detail is that Tashigi is so overwhelmed by his display of, of courage, or whatever you would call it here, belief, that she can't get up at the end of it her legs her legs are weak and she can't stand up and then we get a quick cut to the navy we get a quick cup cut to captain smoker in his formal introduction into the arc who ends up being really interesting but we'll get into that in a second who says where's tashigi we sent her to go get swords and she's just screwing around so we see that that she is a part of the navy which is really interesting and uh it's an interesting introduction to captain smoker who is true to his name leaning back, smoking two big cigars, uh, uh, and part of the Navy. And then we get a quick cut to Sanji in a city square, looking at this beautiful woman with hard eyes. And we cut to that woman, and we see that it's the woman who's been on the cover stories, who's been colluding with Buggy, who wants to search out Luffy, and what it seems like uh, do harm to him or pay him back in some way. And so we see this mystery woman for the first time outside of the cover stories, which is really interesting for anyone and, and a hook for anyone who's been paying attention to them. Oh, and just to jump back about the, the Zoro situation, another little note is that through his display, the shopkeeper who had kind of been criticizing him or deriding him or calling him an amateur in the beginning ends up really going on to Zoro's side just through his display. Uh, so that really speaks of Zoro's ability to almost non-verbally just through his actions and how hard on his sleeve he is and how boldly he embodies his ideals is just so infectious in getting people over to his side as the shopkeeper gradually becomes a believer. So I just thought that was cool. And a little line that I alluded to and but paraphrased, but I kind of need to say it out loud exactly was he says that it's his luck versus the curse. Zoro's so great. And so we cut back uh, and see the rest of the crew and what they're doing. We see flashes of what Nami's doing, what Sanji's doing, uh, some cooking stuff uh, in the fish market, what Usopp's doing. And then we see Luffy, uh, who sees the scaffolding, goes up on the scaffolding, and sees the sights that Gold Rogers saw. And he's just beaming, wide-eyed wonder, idealistic wonder at the sights ahead of him, smiling, just going, wow. And to me, that really just embodies this pirate spirit, this yearning for adventure, and not only for what he wants to become, but the journeys that will take place on the way to that. Uh, it's just embodied to me in Luffy's display here of just going on top of the scaffolding and not having a single fear in his mind, a single negative thought in his mind, and just feeling history here, and feeling what this represents, and feeling Gold, Gold Roger's presence. But then we have a couple of revelations as we see that the mystery woman all this time who has been looking for Luffy is indeed trying to uh, pay him back, so to speak, and is Alvida, who's undergone a bit of a transformation due to having the slip slip fruit. Yeah, so she looks completely different now. Uh, funnily enough, she says that, unfortunately, my beauty was barely enhanced. It's interesting. I guess, that a, that a fruit could do this, and I definitely didn't have any idea that something like this was happening. Uh, I had no thought in my mind that she could possibly be Alvita, 
but she is. She's joined up with Buggy, who also makes an appearance, and they're here. They talk about their epic adventure, the stuff that happened in the cover stories. Their crewmates and a lot of the characters we've come to know over the early arcs are here as well. And yeah, they're here for Luffy, for obvious reasons. But Captain Smoker and the rest of the Navy catch wind of pirate disturbances happening in the square, and so he makes his way over to the square. And we see a bit of characterization for him, as he's very fearsome, and people seem to cower in his wake and look at his authority in fear but at the same time that's there seems to be an element of it only being an appearance or it being selective to maybe adults only or people who he thinks he needs to strike fear in the hearts of because a little girl in the street uh, runs into him with her ice cream and her father is horrified that she's uh, dirtied the pants of Captain Smoker and is stricken by fear but Smoker instead, um, when looking down on her, pats her head and says, uh, Sorry, my pants ate up your ice cream. Next time, have five scoops. And he gives her money to buy another one. Which is interesting. It's very uh, kind of kind, kind of sweet. Don't know if I want to con make conclusions about his character just from that little interaction, but it seems telling to me. Maybe he has a bit of a good heart underneath all that. Maybe he's blinded by ideas of justice. Or maybe not blinded, but just his good heart is overpowered by those sorts of layers. I don't know, but it's interesting. It's interesting. It's an interesting hook for the character. Uh, we see confirmation that the girl that's interacted with Zoro's name is Tashiki, and they want to know what's going on in the square. And what has happened is that Alvida and Buggy have put Luffy up for execution. He's he's about to be killed, and the the reactions of the crew to this are hilarious. Usopp, Zoro, Sanji, especially Usopp, whose mouth is as wide as anything, are in shock. But totally contrasting that, Nami is carrying a bunch of goods on her back and she's just like, good god, not again. She's just like, ugh. Whereas everyone else is shocked. I just love the contrast in that. And Luffy, on the scaffolding, in the guillotine, is annoyed because his nose itches. He is so casual and seemingly dismissive of his situation and not taking it seriously, which, you know, is funny, but ends up being a bit of a precursor to something much more momentous in a second. And chapter 99 opens up with the phrase uh, said by a narrator, legends that endure in the future were legends that took place in the distant past. That's how 99 opens up. And it really just has the tone of a tale, and it uh, makes me remember what I think Isopod commented in the AJP's comments for the last video about the theory of Usopp being the narrator, a storyteller. The tone and language of that doesn't seem very Usopp, but the sentiment very much does, and so I just thought of that. I just love the tone it sets. It, it gives you the feeling of this fantastical tale taking place before your eyes, of new legends being born here, in these events, which is very appropriate for, again, that passing of the torch idea. Luffy continues to not take his his situation very seriously. He's kind of just joking around while he's on stand for execution, contrasting Buggy extremely well, extremely hilariously, as Buggy is just so dead set on executing him for what he literally admits as petty reasons. He says, he's guilty of getting on his high horse and upsetting me, and for that he'll be executed. <laughs> for upsetting him. <laughs> uh, Buggy's funny. Uh, and then we cut away and we go to Usopp and Nami, who are talking about this storm that's about to hit the island, uh, and that they need to look after their ship. They don't want to be stranded here, and because of the commotion in the square, someone could take this opportunity to steal their ship which is literally what happens. Uh, someone is trying to do it. I forget his name, but the guy with the, the, the... He's riding a lion, he has ears. I forget his name. He's associated with Buggy. He's trying to steal the ship. And then we have lines from Smoker who says, Have we ever let a pirate escape from our city? Clearly showing the very hardline stance they have with regards to piracy and how they conceptualize that and how they just stamp it out completely and they intend to trap all the pirates here, all the wanted people, and capture them all. In the midst of the struggle at the execution square and the commotion, Luffy is asked if he has any last words, and all he does while he's in that position is scream, I'm going to be the king of the pirates, to the entire square, to everyone watching. Just bold, complete confidence. And he calls out for Sanji and Zoro, and asks them to help him. And the people in the crowd are laughing at what seems to be his foolishness, as he's about to be executed, saying that he's going to become the King of the Pirates. 
but they are just a representation in my mind of people who just cannot understand those with the type of monstrous will and fixation on this dream that Luffy has. But him calling out Sanji and Zoro stirs up even more of a commotion, as Zoro is an infamous name and people are going, Zoro? Where's Zoro? And uh, it just causes even more of a ruckus. Sanji and Zoro try to rush the scaffolding to help Luffy, but they just can't make it in time and it very obviously we know Luffy's not going to die, but in universe it very much seems like this is going to be the end for Luffy. The sword's over his head and he pretty much accepts that he's about to die. And what he says is chilling. I got chills just thinking about it now. He says, sorry, I'm a goner. And then he laughs. He laughs in the face of complete death and it sends a chill up Smoker's spine. He just looks at it and goes, he laughed. And then it's so dramatic as lightning strikes and there's a huge crash of thunder and it starts raining and the atmosphere just heightens and almost like an act of God, lightning strikes the scaffolding, it hits Buggy, Buggy is fried and Luffy is unscathed and wearing the same smile he was wearing when he said, sorry, I guess I'm a goner when he laughed in the face of death, perfectly his hat falls right in front of him, he just picks it up and plops it on. And he just goes, wow, I'm alive, lucky me. All right, no change, doesn't miss a beat, not a change in his demeanor. There's no relief, there's no change in the in his facial expression, in the way he talks. It just flows from one situation to another, from facing death to being very much alive and free to do what he wants. And he doesn't miss a beat, nothing changes. And so Sanji and Zoro and Luffy make their getaway. But in the midst of all this, Captain Smoker is just completely taken aback and he goes, why did he laugh? Did he know he would be rescued? No, there's no way he could know that the lightning would do that. It was, it was like an act of God, like he accepted his fate. And he's thinking to himself, he accepted this. He accepted that he was going to die despite his grand dreams and he laughed. And this is where the whole cohesive passing of the torch legacy thing comes to fruition here. As Smoker recounts the only other situation he can think of, of a pirate laughing as he was facing death in this very square, in this very spot, Gold Roger, and he's completely stunned. And this is such a deep, profound moment to me. Profound for the whole series, profound primarily for Luffy and what he represents, and I love that it's done from Smoker's point of view. Because we've become intimately accustomed to Luffy and his hijinks and his attitude, and we've it's almost become matter of fact that Luffy is like this. He faces death, he he thinks of death as physical death as secondary, he is so focused and honed in on his ideals that while what he does here is more extreme than anything else we've seen so far, I would say. It's not something that's ever thought of as out of the realms of possibility, and it's very in character for us, so it's not the most shocking thing in the world. But seeing it from the perspective of someone who is not used to being with Luffy as often as we are as the reader is immense. He's chilled to the bone as he sees Luffy's potential and his conviction. The momentous weight of this as it dawns on him that the only two people up until this point have been Luffy and Gold Roger who have done this, and the sheer weight of it as it dawns on him from his perspective is immense for showing just how monumental this person is, Luffy. The only parallel that can be drawn with what he does here is with the legendary Gold Rogers, the king, the last king of the pirates. We're used to Luffy, we're used to him proclaiming these things, but through seeing it from the eyes of someone who is not used to him, through the eyes of someone who just despises piracy for one reason or another, and just feels a shiver go down his spine as he sees what seems to be a recollection of the embodiment of that pirate spirit in Luffy. It's so important for reminding us of the sheer weight that Luffy carries in his dreams and conviction, and the sheer drama of this moment and what it really means. Because without, I think, having seen it from his eyes, we wouldn't have been able to get the full scale of what this moment really signifies in terms of legacy, passing of the torch, of how unique Luffy is. But seeing it through these eyes was a great decision, a great writing decision, because it really frames it in the way that it should be framed. It puts immense weight on the moment. And then from Luffy's perspective, Smoker was right, by my reckoning at least. Luffy had accepted his death, and he accepted it and smiled at the looming prospect of oncoming death. And of course there's the idea of 
him living for his dream, his conviction, his ideals being more important than death, death being secondary, all the way back from what we saw in Syrup Village, I think it was, from the SBS corner through what Oda said, and the way that these people, these kindred spirits of Luffy and Zoro, but for this point, Luffy particularly, how physical death is secondary to defeat and a loss. So of course there's that, that's not news. But also, Luffy has just lived his life up until this point in service of those ideals. He is living with such abandon and loyalty to the type of person he wants to be, and loyalty to his dream, that even if he's not the Pirate King right now, he is living in service and embodying the ideals that will take him there. So he is living with no regrets. He is living in the way he wants to live, with no regrets whatsoever, with nothing to look back on, with nothing to think of as, I could have done this differently. Luffy, as always, lives the way he wants to live, the way that he needs to live, living in the present. And so there's no need for him to fear death, because there's nothing he would have done differently. Him dying here is as loyal of a legacy to who he is as a person than if he were to die 20 years from now. Nothing would change with regards to the type of person he is in sentiment, uh, is what I'm getting. I'm communicating this in a bit of an abstract way, but essentially what I'm saying is that Luffy has lived his life to the fullest. Up until this point, there's nothing he would really change because of how he lives with reckless abandon, how he embodies this spirit. And so there's no reason to be sad about dying because he's lived his life to the fullest. He doesn't think of the missed potential of what he could become. He just thinks, that was a great life, wasn't it? I've lived in the way I wanted to live and I've embodied what I wanted to embody. And I can be proud of that. And it's very rare for people to be able to look death in the face like that and be proud and not have regrets and not fear it because you're so proud of the way you've lived up until that point. That's not a common thing. People are not able to just do that. Fear overtakes you. The very human fear, regrets. People aren't able to live every second of their life as if it was their last and pour their everything into it and be proud of everything and be so full of such conviction. But Luffy is. And Gold Roger was as well. And because of that, it sends a shiver down Smoker's spine. And Smoker also notices that the, the storm is wi almost willing them into this tailwind for their potential escape. And he's going, it's almost as if nature, the force of nature itself is willing this man to survive and carry out his dreams. It almost, it feels larger than life. And it puts this grand feeling towards this, this tale that we've seen so far and everything that Luffy's doing. And as I was reading this, I just felt like I'm reading a legend. I'm reading this new age of piracy, this person who will embody and be the symbol of this new age of piracy, who gets so swept up in his ideals and what he stands for that the very laws of nature can't help but bend to his will. It's very dramatic and that sounds cheesy as I say it, but that's what it feels to me that Luffy is. So larger than life that the story he's in itself can't help but bend to him and encourage him and want him to succeed. But nonetheless, Smoker feels like he has to stop him. And as they make their escape, we get to chapter 100, which like I mentioned earlier, just gives this feeling of this grand tale to add to the feeling of Luffy being this legend. And so it says, these things cannot be stopped. An inherited strength of will, one's dreams, the ebb and flow of the ages. As long as people hunger for freedom, these things will exist. Said by Gold Roger, King of the Pirates. In the storm, as we see this mystery person brave the storm in Logtown looking on at these pirates, specifically this one pirate and his exploits. And there's such a weight to this said by Rogers. Like I said, it just gives you the feeling of this fantastical tale that seems to elevate One Piece in status as you're reading it, as it feels like a legend is unfolding before your eyes. His words in this arc being so applicable to Luffy, so applicable to himself and what pirates stand for, in conjunction with what we just saw from Smoker, seeing Luffy's laughing in the face of death, and it's chapter 102, it just all feels so monumental here. And Oda portrays this as essentially the prologue uh, to the grand story. This is where it really feels like a continuation of the idea of the passing of the torch into Luffy's hands. It's a great summation of where we've been, where we're gonna go, uh, because he literally lists out 
several primary themes of, of the work of One Piece. There's inherited strength of will, inherited will, uh, dreams, obviously, huge theme, hunger for freedom, which has been a huge theme throughout the series as well. The ebb and flow of the ages, which sort of alludes to the idea of this grand, the grandness of this adventure and the impact that it'll have on history. And these things will exist. These things will always exist, as said by Gould Roger. As we see, well, we, this impressive figure, very interesting and ominous and filled, shrouded in mystery, which we now know as Dragon. A hell of a character design, the tattoo on his face, it just really made me wonder who the hell this guy is, why he's being presented in this storm. Great visuals, but why is he being presented in this storm with Gold Roger's words overlying him? Uh, we have some hijinks as Buggy and Alvita decide that they need to continue to pursue them out of town. Smoker uh, continues on his path to stop Luffy. He feels like he needs to stop him. He says he cannot let him leave as a Marine, as... A demonstration of what he stands for, which again shows that conviction of the Marines, and uh, it's a great hook for, for Smoker, and I'm really interested in seeing where he goes. We already know quite a bit about his conviction and his, his beliefs and the type of person he might be, but I want to know more. And so Toshigi catches up with Zoro in this chase, and I didn't mention it earlier, but she continuously seems to represent Quina, just to show parallels with Quina as a reflection of who Quina was. Uh, and Zoro just can't get her out of her out of his mind. The way she speaks about womanhood, what it means to be a woman in this world, how she looks and acts, how she wields a sword. She's very prideful. She wants to be treated with dignity and respect. And Zoro just sees so many parallels here that he can't work it out. Like what's going on? But Tashigi's goal here is to take away Zoro's legendary sword, the Wado uh, Ichimoji, because it's revealed to her here that that's who he is. A person like him. An evil man like that doesn't deserve it, and the sword cannot be crying in his possession. So it's a nice hook for her as well, for her journey going forward. Smoker eventually catches up to Luffy, and he pins him down. But then we have someone, a figure who appears behind him, just hulking over him in, in, a, black, in a black robe or a, a black hooded cape or something, with a grin on his face, Dragon. Smoker says that the government is after his head, which is interesting. And then Dragon says the world is waiting for our answer. And that is something, that's a curious line, because I don't know what that's signifying at all. Uh, I assume that gaps will be filled in, but I don't really know what he means by the world waiting for him, what his answer could be. Uh, it's alluding to something, but at the moment I don't really have an idea. But it's a hell of a hook, for sure. And then he lets Luffy escape. He helps Luffy to escape from Smoker. And when questioned about this by, by Smoker, he says... What reason would I have to get in the way of another man's voyage? Which hints at ideas of, again, maybe kinship, uh, sharing of the pirate spirit of adventure, just wanting him to carry out his voyage, maybe through experience, having experienced voyages himself. Lots of really interesting things about Dragon established in just one chapter. Really efficient, and I can't wait to learn more about him. The storm begins in earnest, it's just raging around them. It just feels grand. It just symbolizes, I think, the grand stakes that the party is about to go into. Perhaps the darkness that the party will go into as they continue their voyage. Perhaps the increased threat of the upcoming arcs and sagas. I just felt like this was ominous and indicative of certain things that might happen in the future. In terms of scale, scope, threat, darkness, and tone. Uh, not sure, that's just the feeling I got. Either way, they make it on the boat, and they make their escape. And they're pursued by a hell of a lot of people. They're pursued by Alvita, by Buggy, who just kind of smiles as he says, we're off to the Grand Line, how nostalgic, let's do it. Which is honestly kind of raw, kind of raw from Buggy. He goes there with Alvita to go after them, to go after Luffy and crew, for obvious reasons. And then Smoker says, you know what, no, I have to go after them, I have to stop them as well. Uh, Toshigi says that she needs to capture Zoro for the reasons we talked about earlier. So, uh, but then it's it's posited to Smoker that, you know, the higher-ups are not going to approve of this mission he's going on. It's reckless. They're not going to be down for it. And he says, they're going to tell me to not do it? I don't care. I don't give a shit. He doesn't care about the red tape surrounding it. This is just something he needs to do. He needs to stop Luffy. This is his conviction, his resolve to stop him. And it really makes me wonder what's, what's made him think this way. Why is there something to do with his past that's made him think this way? I don't know. Um, either way, it's really interesting. And Smoker and Dragon, two very interesting characters right off the bat that I'm super engaged with. 
uh, Tashiki's pretty good as well, and Smoker's gonna pursue them no matter what the red tape says, no matter what their superiors say. But then we cut away and the crew are making their way towards the Grand Line. Finally, we're about to hit it. We're about to get there in the midst of this storm. Uh, there's a there's a lighthouse, a guiding light ahead of them. Uh, th as they see, that's the entrance to the Grand Line. And well, forgive me for being a little poetic and waxing lyrical, but I see this lighthouse ahead of them as representative of each of their dreams, as symbolic of what they're trying to do. You know, the Grand Line is the next goal, but beyond that, there is this light that all the five of them, all five of the crew so far, aspire to reach their own specific goals. And they show a summation of that. Let's do it. Let's do it, we're doing it, full steam ahead. Beyond that light is the entrance to the Grand Line, so we're doing this, and of course they are. And Sanji says, I'm going to find the all blue. He puts his foot on this barrel. Luffy says, I'm going to be king of the pirates. He does the same. Zoro says that he's going to be the greatest swordsman. He does the same. Grinning. Love it. Sanji was looking very cool, cigarette in his mouth as he was doing it as well. Nami, grinning, puts her foot on the barrel and says, I'm going to draw a map of the world. And Usopp, last but not least... I'm going to become a brave warrior of the sea. And they just go, Grand Line, here we come. What a way to end off this arc, this prologue, and just give a taste of what the Grand Line could consist of. This immense scale, this storm on the horizon, this breadth and depth of the world, so much more of the world to explore, so many more adventures to come. It's just thrilling. I love how this arc ends, and all these people pursuing them as well. So many great foundations laid, and transitions made, and hooks. Oh, it's so great. Just just going off a list of all the hooks we saw, there's, all, there's them just declaring all their dreams and how they're going to uh, achieve them as they get into the Grand Line. That's a great hook. We have the stuff with Mihawk and Shanks and Yasop. What, what are they doing? How are they going to be involved in the future? That involves Usopp because of his father, that involves Luffy because of Shanks, and that involves Zoro because of Mihawk as well. Uh, so I just can't wait for that. There's Smoker, who has a very interesting perspective as he's pursuing them. I want to learn more about him. There's Tashigi along with him, how she is involved with Zoro and how she reflects Quina as well. Dragon? Who the hell is that? I want to learn more about him. And then there's Buggy and Elvita pursuing in the Grand Line. This is the prologue. I'm all for it. That was absolutely thrilling. One of my favorite arcs so far, this would be at least a solid to strong eight uh, for me, Logtown. It was great. And as for my thoughts about the East Blue as a whole, I think it's been a, a great introduction into the world of One Piece. You know, was every chapter masterful? No. Um, like I've talked about, there is some thinness throughout, but I'm not really interested in getting hung up about that. I'm just interested in the thematic beats, what's been immediately established. Um, it's been established. Some of these themes have been established from chapter one through the chapter with Shanks and Luffy and him setting off. And as things come together and the crew builds and their dreams coalesce and they're all kindred spirits and all their how all their motivations are so different but yet intertwined and overlap in that way. E East Blue has done a great job as a saga, as these first 100 chapters, of establishing all these themes, all these character motivations, great character moments, great coalescing of the themes and character moments at the end of arcs, in this arc, in Sierra Village, in Arlong Park, Baratie, Chapter 1. I've been a huge fan of all of that. That's right up my alley. And the way that the world continues to build in the background, uh, through the cover stories, through little bits of details that are interconnected and provide context for characters, like the detail with Captain Morgan and Captain Kudo that we learn in Syrup Village. But not only that, how it coalesces. Because if it just goes on parallel in the background, that's not doing a ton. Uh, it's cool. It gives you a greater idea of the world that this takes place in, and it immerses you more. But... I like when all of that coalesces, and arcs like Logtown are a great example of these things coalescing. So when it all comes together in these ways, as characters from previous arcs and the cover story elements, and different views of how the world and people we've come to know and love, minor characters are reacting to the exploits of our primary characters, how all of that comes together is just so gratifying. And I really hope there's a lot more of that going forward, on a grander scale, I imagine, as things continue to diverge and expand. But yeah, East Blue has been fantastic. It establishes so much, but there's also so much payoff within it. It works as a self-contained saga in and of itself. We have great apexes of character arcs for Usopp, particularly in Syrup Village, but then an example of his development and progression 
in Arlong Park. We have the stuff to do with Nami and how she breaks free of her chains and sees her freedom right in front of her and grasps hold of it and has this kinship with everyone else in a really beautiful way. We have Sanji's backstory and how that coalesces with his relationship with Zeph and the way him and Luffy conceptualize dreams. We have Zoro and his backstory and how him and Luffy just immediately click and Luffy himself being the best embodiment of One Piece's spirit and themes and ideas and soul and heart. It's been a great experience and I thank everyone who's helped contribute to it so far and long may it continue, you know? I, like I said, I'm not even 10% done, but it feels like I've seen so much. So if I had to sum up my arc rankings, it's tough. My favorite would still be Arlong Park, I think, but then after that, it's honestly very close between Baratie and Logtown. Let's just put it at a tie for second place between Baratie and Logtown. Both of them very solid in such different ways, but equal in my mind, more or less. Then I would say Syrup Village, for how cohesive and poetic it is, then probably Romance Dawn, but with Chapter 1 being one of the very best in the series, and then Orange Town after that. In terms of the character rankings, you know, this, this arc did some really interesting things for a few of them. Um, Luffy, I think, was elevated the most, but honestly, it didn't really change the rankings from the last arc, so the rankings are still the same. The closeness of characters between each other may be a bit different, but the order is the same, and that would be Genzo slash Arlong at number 10, Zeph at 9, Nojiko at 8, Mihawk at 7, Shanks at 6, Sanji at 5, Usopp at 4, Nami at 3, Zoro at 2, and Luffy at 1. So far, I would give this series a solid 8 out of 10. It's been consistently fun, enjoyable, emotional, hype, raw thematically potent, poetic in a lot of ways, and it's been a joy. It's been a joy sharing it with you guys, so thank you. Thank you for continuing to come to the streams, comment your ideas, uh, to support me, uh, and I really appreciate all of it, and I'm excited for more. Long may it continue, but I think that's where I'm going to end off here. Uh, many thanks for watching, and uh, once again, if you'd like early access to the next ARC review, it's available on Patreon um, for anyone who's interested. But yeah, that aside, uh, I think that's about it. See you in the Twitch streams if you're interested. See you on Twitter. And uh, see you in my next chapter of my journey with One Piece. Many thanks for watching.